our story is Adam and Eve's story. We were hiding in the garden, making excuses for our sin, unable to cover up our shame. Our story is Jonah's story. We were running from God, denying our calling, surrounded by a raging sea. Our story is a prodigal son story. We were wasting our blessings, lost in our failures, too afraid to return home. Our story is Peter's story. We were unbelieving, full of fear and doubt, our faith slowly sinking beneath the waves. But that is not the end of our story. We are all longing to be restored. We want to stop running. We want to be found. We want to believe, and we are crying out for a savior. So God stepped in into a broken world, into human form, into our very lives. God stepped into our mess, into our sin, into our failure, our fear, our doubt. He stepped into death, and the door shut behind him. and left it all in the grave. He wiped clean our story and started writing a new one. One without shame, without fear, without death. A story full of love and forgiveness. A story of redemption and restoration. It's our life story. It's his story. It's a resurrection story. Praise the Lord. Let's lift him up right where we are right now. Hallelujah. Let's get in one mind and one accord this morning. Unified together to uplift his name. Lord, you are worthy. And we have come together to praise you this morning. We have come together to lift you up. We have come together to experience your presence. We have come together to hear your word and respond. Have your way. With us this morning, Jesus.
you this morning, Lord. We praise you and worship you today. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus.
yours, Lord, and I lift you up and magnify you today. Strengthen my faith, Lord. I praise you and lift you up in this house, Jesus.
Amen. Miracle worker. Promise keeper. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Nothing changes him. Hallelujah. You return with me to Psalms chapter 78. Psalms 78. And we'll begin reading with verse 1. Psalm 78. And verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. What is it that we are not going to keep away from our children from the generation to come? What is it? Again, the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. Preach a little while this morning on the flock of the rock. The flock of the rock. Lord Jesus, I love you and thank you for all so far you have done, for feeling your presence in this house, and I know right where they are as well you are. There is nothing that can impede the flow of your spirit or your word. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would have your way and that your word would flow right now in Jesus' name, unimpeded, that you, O oh Lord, would move in this place that you would move, O oh Lord, in this message and do what it is that you intend to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to pick up reading here in Psalm 78, but it is important to remember what it is we just read. That this and everything else that we're going to read in Psalm 78 is supposed to be built on a foundation of the first four verses here, especially the last one we read in verse 4. The praises of the Lord, his strength, his wonderful works that he has done. Beginning with verse 7. Picking up with verse 7. That they might set their hope in God and not, for, not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And might not be as their father's, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. That's given as an example of a generation that had turned its back on God. It is the inability to fight in a battle, the desire, although equipped, not to fight. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forget his works and his wonders that he had shown them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand as a heap. In the daytime also, he led them with a cloud and all the night with a light of fire. He clave, that is, he split, the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as of out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Again, it is mentioned here, not this time not to not forget, but that they did forget. The Lord had to remind them because they did forget. And as soon as they forgot his works, as soon as they weren't praising him for them and for what he had done, they began to have a downfall. Now I'm going to be skipping through chapter 78, but everywhere else that I'm skipping, it's going to say basically the same thing, and that is this. 
they forgot God had to punish them, and then God delivered them. Every single instance. This is a story, Psalm 78, as he says at the beginning. The concept here is to set up praise and worship for what God has done and not to forget what he has done before. While you are where you are now. It is not praising God for what hasn't happened yet. It's not praising God for what's happening right now. It is praising God and not forgetting what it is he has already done while you're where you are right now. Picking up with verse 19. He starts out here and we know exactly what he's talking about. The first verses, the verses we just finished reading. We know exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about taking the children of Israel through uh, to the promised land and taking them through the wilderness. And he has mentioned already a couple of things that happened at the beginning. The parting of the Red Sea, the cloud by day and the, and the pillar of fire by night. But God isn't done yet. Everybody in here say, God isn't done yet. You don't sound very convinced. Maybe you guys there, I can't hear, maybe you sounded more convincing. Verse 19, yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? <laughs> Behold, he smote the rock and the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? This is a people who are not satisfied with what God just got done doing. Each instance that he moves in their life, each instance that he touches them, can he make a table in the desert, in the wilderness? This is not good. This is sarcasm that is leveled at God is a bad idea. You might like sarcasm and that might be some part of your personality. I entreat you, do not do that to God. He does not appreciate it at all because he does not believe he's on the same level you and I are on. And they're saying, oh, can you furnish a table in the wilderness? <laughs> Behold, he smote a rock and waters came out. And they said, where's the bread? And he gives them bread and they go, where's the meat? Every instance is not good enough. The miracle that God performs isn't good enough. I need another miracle. Where's the next miracle, God? Oftentimes I find myself acting like a little baby. And I cry when I need my bottle. Then I cry when I need my diaper changed. Then I cry when I need to go to sleep. And I cry when I wake up. It's not supposed to stay that way in your relationship with God. It's not supposed to be this thing where I go from the one blessing to the next blessing, one miracle to the next miracle, to where I begin to take them for granted. Every once in a while, and it's scriptural, God stops everything and says, you need to pay attention to what I've already done. You need to understand my power and what I've done in your life to this point. Because you're just getting by with the next one and the next one. And I'm not getting the praise I deserve to get for what I have done for you already. So everything's going to stop until you praise me. I recognize right now that that is a message that is not what everybody wants to hear. Well, get on board the train because the train has left the station. It's what you're going to hear today. We're going to pick up reading verse 19, verse 20, verse 21. Let's do it 20. No, I'm sorry. We already read 20. Let's go to verse 24. And had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven. Have you ever had really good corn? You can have corn better than the corn of heaven. Man did eat angels food. He sent them meat to the full. Of course, he's talking about manna here, uh, which term, the word means what is it. They never did figure out what it was. But here we have a clue that I don't hear very many people talk about when they talk about manna. It says it's the corn of heaven. It's, it says it's angels' food. 
God went way beyond their own world to feed them. Please, get what I'm saying. He went beyond what they could even have gotten on their own in any way, shape, or form. This was a miracle beyond their ability to make happen. And they got sick of it. I said they got sick of it. They ate it until they said, this is this, this it? This is, this is all? All we're going to get is angel food? This is what they said. All we're going to get is this miraculous stuff that falls from the sky, and you can eat it, and, you know, and that's it? We don't even know what it is. It's filling us up. But is that all you got, God? Is that all you got? I am afraid. I am afraid that in my flesh I have reached this point more than once where I'm going, God, is that really all you got? You've answered my prayers. You've met my needs. You've done so sometimes in ways that I could never have imagined that you did it. Manna from heaven. But what do you got next, God? What's next? He calls an east wind to blow in the heaven, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He rained flesh also upon them as dust and feathered fowls, like as the sand of the sea. What did he do? The Bible says he gave them quail. He blew them in. This script, these scriptures are saying that he blew them in from somewhere else. Well, minding your own business, out doing your own little thing. All of a sudden, you're just picked up by an east wind or a south wind, whichever flock you happen to be a part of, and you're just blown out in the wilderness for somebody to eat you. God provides for his people. He will provide. If he calls himself something, it is not a halfway something. How would you like it if, I said, you know what, I can come and I can cut your dog's hair. Right now we can say cut people's hair. I mean, I think I could make a business out of it. Cut your hair for half price. I'm not a good barber, but I'll cut it for half price. And you say, okay, understanding there's going to be some limitations to it, you know. But I come over, and not only do I, do I have limitations, but I come over and I cut the dog halfway, literally. That's in this walk. I say, I'll cut your grass. Come over there, cut half your yard, walk away. I'll get the other half next week. You are not going to be very pleased with that, are you? I'm going to tell you right now that I wouldn't be pleased with it. And I'm really not pleased with halfway preaching. I'm really not pleased with halfway teaching. I'm not satisfied with halfway going in my relationship with God. Why? Because it really doesn't do anything at all. Oh, yeah, sure, half of it's okay, but look at the other half. And it messes up the entire thing. It doesn't look right, and it isn't right. Let me tell you something else. God's not pleased with halfway praise. He's not pleased with praise that just goes this far, but is not willing to go as far as it ought to go wherever it is I am. We say, I'm sitting at home, I'm not sitting in my church, I'm not able to praise God, the last thing is a lie. The last thing is not true. Sure, you're not in the building, sure, you're not here with us, but you can praise God right where you are, and you should praise God right where you are. He's the same God, He didn't change, and you're feeling His presence right now, I guarantee it, and you should praise Him for it. Praise God for what? Look at where I am. That's not what we were reading in, cha in chapter 78. What were we reading? Praise him for what he's already done. Praise him for the accomplishments he has done in your life. Because when he says he's something, he really is something. When he says he's your provider, he's your provider 100%, not halfway. The fact is, this isn't going to affect you. He will provide for you. The Bible says he's your protector. The fact is, he's not a protector halfway. He will protect you. He will keep you with his mighty right hand, he says. He will watch after you. But what are you doing in return? Are you willing to praise God where you are right now? This message is going to propel us, all of us, those in here and those in your homes, at the end of it to do something, to do something, not just to hear something. Let's pick up with verse 42. They remembered not his hand, nor the day which he delivered them from the enemy. There you go. More of that. 
how he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan and had turned their rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent diverse sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs, which destroyed them. Does this sound familiar? What is it that the psalmist is talking about now? He's talking about Egypt. He's talking about the Pharaoh. He's talking about being uh, the children of Israel, being trapped in Egypt, and God having to send ten plagues to set the people free. This is what he is referencing here. Bishop preaches a fantastic message that I never get tired of hearing. I've only heard a few times, but I'd love to hear it in the future. It's called One More Night with the Frogs. And it's about Pharaoh's decision in the middle of being completely covered in frogs and his whole house and everything. Frogs are not the prettiest things. They're not what you want to be covered in. We're not talking about a house covered in horses. Okay? Frogs. And he chose to live with them one more night. It shows where the mindset is. We cannot become trapped in this mindset. Well, I'll just stay here. One more night's not going to hurt me. I'll say that on the shore. It ain't going to kill you. Some things that do not kill can hurt. A bad mindset can eventually kill you. It can mess you up. Picking up from where we left off here, it says, uh, verse uh, 46, he gave also their increase unto the caterpillar and their labor unto the locusts. <laughs> he was very particular. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. Understand that this, this is saying that God's plan was specific, direct. It was aimed at the things the Egyptians relied on for survival. And he took them out one thing at a time. Verse 48, he gave up their cattle also to the hail and their flocks to hot thunderbolts. With so many gods that the Egyptians had, I can imagine that they never thought there'd be one god who could do all the things to take away all their stuff. There's no way in the world, well, they might get this, but I still have that. They might eat my, my crop, but I still got my cattle. And God's coming along and he's taking everything out, one thing at a time. He knew exactly what punishment to use to make Egypt let God's people go. Verse 49, he cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. That doesn't mean he meant it and means angels with the intent to do harm. I have my own thing on this and I'm not going to get into it. Right now, but there's a lot of people out there, a lot, most people, who do not understand what the death angel is. They do not understand that he has been, he is found in Old and New Testament. He is listed as a destroyer and he is not a demon. He is God ordained. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to what? To the pestilence. Uh oh. Fits, doesn't it? All right, we know where we are now. And smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength, in the tabernacles of Ham. But that doesn't mean tabernacles made out of Ham. It is Ham, the person. <laughs> but made his own people to go forth like sheep and guided them in the wilderness like a flock. He caused his people to go like sheep and guided them like a flock. The people didn't understand. The people didn't have to understand. If you're a flock of sheep, you don't get to, to get the schedule from the shepherd as to what's going to be happening. That's not how it works. If you're a flock, if you're a flock of sheep, you simply do what you're told. You are herded. You are herded in the place that the shepherd wants you to go. If you are a flock of the rock, then you are going where the rock herds you to go. I'm sorry. It's not really, sheep are not that bright. They don't really protect themselves all that well, okay? And the Lord says and it, more than one time that this is who we are like. And we don't like that because we want to be something cool. And we don't understand how cool it is to be the flock of the rock. To be a flock that is protected by the rock of ages. 
by the one who does not move and will not change. I don't have to know where he's going. I know him, and that's enough. I said, I don't have to know where I'm going. I know him, and that is enough. And it says, so here he led them on safely, so that they feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. Verse 65. You, child of God, will go through the same things that everybody else does. This scripture they is love to be used, and it is true as long as you put it in its context and you understand the, the fullness of the word of God. The scripture says it rains on the just and the unjust. It does. This virus is just like that. It's a rain that falls on everybody. But the outcome isn't the same. It may fall on us, but it will not destroy us. It may fall, and we may have to go through things, but it will not be our destruction. The waters can close on the enemies, and that's what God does with these kinds of things, is he traps the enemy to destroy him. Keep that in mind. It is not intended to destroy us. Every, listen to me, every single time that God brought a pestilence in the word of God, his people had revival. Say it again, because you need to understand it. You need to understand what's going on. Every time, you can study it, that in the Word of God, where there was a pestilence, where there was this type of a trouble, there was a revival in the people of God directly following and because of it. Every time. Verse 65, here's why. And the Lord awakened as one out of sleep and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. (laughs) And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the the tribe of what? He chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. Judah means praise. And he built his sanctuary like high places, like the earth which he had established forever. This is what God did. To to men, it was like he woke up. He was never asleep. He certainly wasn't drunk. But it was like that. It was like he woke up and shouted. It was like he jumped up from his seat and said, enough is enough. There's coming a day when that's what's going to happen here. God's going to say, all right, fine, that's enough. Enough of this, and the virus is going to go away. It's happened many, many times before. God says, that's it. In South America, there's a bird, and he's a beautiful bird. And if a bird could know such a thing, he knows he's beautiful. They call him the cock of the rock. What he does is he's brilliant red and orange gets up on his little his little arena that he builds himself. And then he struts around there trying to attract the girl. Now, the girl is a little brown bird that doesn't look like anything. But to him, she does, you know. And he's doing his dance, and he's doing and it's an extremely, it's one of the most complicated uh, rituals found in the animal kingdom of any kind. And he finally, you know, you attract the mate, you get the job done. And they set up a nest. They don't even set the nest up where his arena is. The nest is 600 and some feet away from, from the arena. There she is, the important one. There are the eggs, the important thing. And they're all over there. Meanwhile, he's still over here, brightly lit up. Any predator that comes along, well, ain't going to miss him. There he is. And oftentimes, although this is a a natural thing, and of course there's no evil found in this. The idea of something bright and shiny and arrogant protecting its small arena, not even close to where the important thing is. It reminds me of the devil. Right now, he thinks he's beautiful. He never ever learns this lesson. He does the same thing over and over again. Right now, he's strutting his stuff, and he's talking to everybody, whoever will listen to him, about how great he is, and 
look, the world's not moving, and churches, they're not even meeting, and I've really pulled off a, I've pulled off a big thing. The same exact nonsense that he was doing before Jesus walked in, I preached last Sunday and took the keys away from him. It's the same thing. He doesn't understand what it is that's happening. And I don't suppose at this point, if he hasn't learned now, he's never going to learn. I don't think he's ever going to get the picture. That he's not the one in control. That just because he calls something his own doesn't make it his own. He doesn't have his own things. It's always somebody else. You ever been around someone who just stole your stuff all the time? Hopefully you didn't hang around them too long. But I've, I, I've had it happen to me. And things start disappearing. And, what's that? and they'll, oh, that's mine. I, I, that's mine. It's not yours. It's got my name on it. My father used to do it. He did it with all of his stuff. I only learned a little. I did a little bit. I never did go all the way with it. But he taught me, you know, put your name on it. You got a book, put your name in the, in the spine of the book. You got something, you know, like that. So I was talking to somebody, and it literally happened one time. He said, oh, no, no, that's not. That's my book. That's, that's mine. I said, can I let me see it? He didn't want to let me see it. First bad sign. Then when it, he let me see it, I flipped it open, and there it was. Scribbled out. Well, that's not your name. That's not going to work, man. I'm, I, I'm the one who wrote it in there. I know that's mine. You just mark through it. <laughs> the devil does this. It belongs to me. And no, it doesn't. It never did. If you think that the devil is causing this virus, you don't understand. You don't understand anything. God has allowed it, but he has allowed it for a good purpose. There is a reason far outweighing the negative results, far outweighing the negative results. He knows what that is. He knows exactly what it is that he is allowing and what it is that he is doing. I have said personally, you don't have to adhere to this philosophy that God took and put the pause button down on the world and said everything stop right now. Got out of hand too far. This is an opportunity to get back in hand. His hand. Fix it. Time for all the noise to die down and the Lord's voice can be heard clear. Do not let this moment pass you by. Life will pick up again. It will return to a very similar state, if not exactly the same. I pray that we don't return back the same. But I'm telling you that we will if we don't get what the message is saying this morning. I cannot forget who it is I'm praising. I cannot forget where it is he has brought me from and what he has already done. Sometimes we can be like that cock in the rock as well because when you hang around the devil's philosophies and not God's, you're going to pick up on whatever it is you're hanging around. After a while, it's going to be you strutting your stuff. Look what I've done. Well, this was going on. I don't want to get into it. Everybody has different opinions on what should and should not be happening. So I'm not going to do that. But maybe there's something, let's just put it this way. Maybe there's something that you're doing while this is going on that you're taking a tremendous amount of pride in. And you really ought to stop strutting your stuff. You really ought to chill out with it just a little bit. God is the only one who sits on the throne. The throne does not fit me. It only fits him. How can it happen? Brother Star, how can we go from believing and having faith and praising and worshiping God for what he's done to just sitting around going, oh, well, woe is me. What's happening? There's something that is called body dysmorphic disorder, BDD. And the problem with this disorder is that one part of someone's body who has this disorder is constantly on their minds. They cannot uh, stop trying to improve it, even if it can't be improved upon or doesn't need to be improved upon. In their mind, it is not right. There is a, a phrase that is said quite often uh, within the group, and it is, I am not even. If you don't know, there are those scientists who think they know everything, <laughs> got to dig into all the little stuff, who have dug in and said, beauty is about symmetry. 
uh, that, if you don't know, half of your face, now everybody's looking at my face, that's going to be great, half of your face is not even to the other half. And their philosophy is, and it's been around for quite a while, is that the more even those two halves are, the prettier you are. Yeah, I know, it don't make any sense to me either. I mean, I've seen some people, they are definitely both sides ugly. But to a person with a disorder, they say, I'm not even. It's not right. Something is skewed. Something is wrong, even when it's not. Here's how we can get off from where we're supposed to be. By not focusing on what the focus should be on. By looking at one little thing and saying, oh, that's not right. It falls in, it causes us to fall into a whole bunch of philosophies that are not true. We start talking about how beauty is good and evil is ugly and it's completely not true. As a matter of fact, it's a little bit the opposite because the scripture clearly says that the devil is beautiful and clearly says that Jesus was not somebody you'd turn and look at. He was plain. So that doesn't fit. Another thing that doesn't fit is that it's, it's not right, it's incorrect. It is incorrect to say, this one thing on me needs fixing. Because in all of us, in every one of us, there are multiple things that need fixing. The only way that we get anything done is that we don't focus on those all these things that need fixing only. There's got to be somewhere in there where there is a praise for what God has made us be. Remembering that everybody has it. There's a scripture that goes with this. There's a scripture that fits this. Matthew chapter 23, beginning with verse 23. Jesus is speaking. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes, of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. These ought you to have done and not leave the other undone. He said, you're so focused on these things. See, these, these measurements were things that they could catch other people on. You need to get what I'm saying. They could catch them on it because they didn't do it quite right. And they go, ah, see, you're not righteous because you didn't fulfill this minute thing that you're supposed to do. And they themselves were forgetting quite, quite greater, more important things. Wall, judgment, mercy, and faith. Going to the wayside. And Jesus calls them hypocrites. He says you're supposed to get them all done. The little things and the big things. Get them all done. You blind guides, verse 24, which strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. While you're focusing on that teeny tiny little thing that needs fixing or that is wrong in somebody else's life, Maybe that teeny tiny thing is the thing that's keeping you from praising God like you should praise Him. Well, God, I'll shout when that thing's fixed. You see. And God says that you are swallowing camels. You are literally swallowing impossible things while you're trying to keep the gnat out of your mouth. Verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make the clean, you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Don't get caught up in a single event. Don't get caught up in a single thing being wrong. Oh, we've got this virus. Do not get caught up 
in it. And I'm telling you, that's hard to do, but it is what God wants. Do not be in just in the now situation. He is the same God that brought you here. And that will be the same God that will keep you from here. He's God now. He didn't stop being God. And your, and your proof of it is what he's done for you already. Remember what he's done. And praise him for it. Because you are the flock of the rock. You are important to God. You matter to him. And he is the one who is leading this party where it's going. Psalm 34. I like the musicians to come. Psalm 34 lays this out so beautifully and so plainly. And this is a psalm that David wrote. Interestingly enough, this is the psalm that he wrote when he acted like a crazy person in front of Abimelech in order to get out of there. Because he put himself, his flesh put him in a terrible situation. He did this. Acted crazy in order to get away. And once he had done so, he wrote this psalm. And it starts out like this. I will bless the Lord at all times. What times? What times? All times. Would that, would that count this times? Yes, it's the same. All times. I will bless the Lord. It's an absolute state. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. A praise that is unending. A praise that does not stop. That does not cease. Why? Because your God does not stop. And he does not cease. And his works do not stop and do not cease. As this song says that we're going to sing uh, here in a minute. Just because you can't see it. Just because you can't feel it. Doesn't mean anything. He's still God. And he's still working the miracles. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, my soul. Your praise is personal, which means this. You don't have to be in this sanctuary to offer it up. Right where you are, if you're there, that's where your praise comes from. So right where you are, you can praise God. Find yourself some space. If it's if you're around a bunch of people that you, you don't feel comfortable worshiping, then get somewhere where you can. But hopefully, you are already somewhere. Get somewhere right now where you can praise Him like you need to praise Him. Because it's what the message is about. Praise God in what's going on for what He's already done for you. He's already made a way. Hundreds of times. Let your soul boast in the Lord. You know how to praise Him. You know what it is that He's done for you. Right now. Those things should be on your lips. Right now, those things should be in your mind and heart. Right now, where you are, lift your hands. Right now, where you are, begin to exalt him. Begin to lift him up. Because listen to this next part. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. When you do this, when you do this, then those who have humbled themselves, not caught up, dancing around on a rock, not pretending that there are anything, but just those who are trying to serve and live after God and do what's right. The humble will hear thereof and it'll make them glad. I said it'll make them, your praise will make them happy. They're going to be lifted up from where they are. Next verse. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Right now, lift your hands. Right now, lift him up. Right now, praise his name. Right now, magnify the Lord with me. Right now, let us exalt his name. Right now, Jesus, you're worthy. Right now, Jesus, I lift you up. Right now, I exalt your name. I praise you. I worship you. I'll leap for joy. Dance in your name. I'll clap my hands. I'll lift my voice. I'll lift my hands and surrender. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. And I Put all of my faith and trust in you. I remember where you brought me from. 
I remember the sin that you healed me from. The sickness you've delivered me from in the past, I recall it. And I'm magnifying you together with your people right now. And the distance doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter at all. Together, we're lifting you up and praising your name. Feel his presence. Feel his presence right now. Feel it right now and know that he is there. Know that he does indeed inhabit the praises of his people. That my lifting him up brings him down where I am. It causes an, an action to take place. The presence of God actively moving actively working I make it possible by opening my heart and praise and worship and lifting him up I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears don't be afraid praise him instead and the fear will go it'll go if you praise him they looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed if you're, don't, you're tired of being ashamed depressed downtrodden downhearted with your, your, your knees dragging the ground lift up understand look to the hills when it's cometh your help see who it is understand it's the same God he loves you he's there he's doing it and you'll not be ashamed. It will lighten you. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all. How many? All of his troubles. Every trouble that I've had to this point, God has saved me from. Every one of them he's delivered me from. This uncircumcised Philistine is no different from the lion and the bear that I've already faced. I'll have victory over this as well. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about those that fear him and delivereth them. He's not just having a party. The angel's not just sitting down watching what's going on in your life. No, he's there for a purpose. He's there for a reason. He's there to deliver. Just like in Egypt, he's going to walk through the enemy's camp and wipe out what's most important to him until he lets you go. Oh, taste and see. But the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Right now, trust in him. As we sing, you sing. As we worship, you worship. Together, let's do it together in unity. Let's exalt his name and praise him. And praise him right where we are. We are the flock of the rock. We are following the one, the only one who has the answer. Hallelujah.
taste and see that the Lord is good. Right where you are, lift him up. Right where you are, exalt his name. Yes, God, I praise you. Yes, God, I'll exalt you. You're worthy, you're worthy. You're worthy, you're worthy. Yes, you are. Even when I don't see it, you're Even when I don't feel it, you're worthy. you have done. I will not forget what you have done for me. My praise will always be on my lips for what you have done in my life, for your salvation, for your provision, for your protection and your direction. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I hope you've done that. I hope that where you are, you have lifted him up and praised him. And if you're not done, then don't be done. You got you got the whole place to yourself. Praise God the way he needs to be praised. Put him in that first place position. Let him sit on the throne. It's his proper place. Before we dismiss, please keep in mind that every Wednesday, every Wednesday at 7, we will we live stream the Acts Bible study. You can get it right on this same page, also on this same page. At 12 o'clock will be our, our second Sunday school 
uh, production called, entitled The Kingdom. 12 o'clock today, right here. We hope that God is continuing to bless and keep you. We know He is. We hope that you see it and understand it. But praise Him no matter what. Praise Him no matter what. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for all you have done. Let your presence reign supreme in our homes and in our lives. And do your full and complete work through all of this, as only you can do. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Keep you. And have his face shine upon you. I'll give you peace. In Jesus' name.